Hi guys, it's Nico and this is the Automation Gym. In this video, we're going to be looking at how to set up addressable LED strips or pixel strip with locks on for under 45 pounds. Let's get into it. And the first thing that we're going to need for the job is obviously the hardware. Now, when it comes to hardware, I have pretty much everything in front of me, so I'll be able to show it to you. So obviously we're going to need the controller and the controller is actually what makes everything so cheap. Now, what I'm going to be using today is going to be an ESP microcontroller. Let me see if we zoom in. Yeah, there we go. Now, the ESP is going to give us the ability to flash custom firmware on it, or in this case, an open source firmware on it, which is free. And that is what's going to be controlling the LEDs and telling them what color they need to go to, what sequence they need to go to, and so on. And of course, we are going to need the LED strip itself. Now, the LED strip that I have, I have a small piece in here that I'll be able to show you, is a WS2818B, um, which is, as you can see, a constant power and a communication channel, and every single LED chip inside can be individually controlled, so every single segment of that LED strip can be individually controlled. Um, also, that ESP that I have in front of me, is actually powered by a micro USB cable. Now, depending on the chip that you go with, it might be a different uh, power supply requirement. It might be just five volts direct to the board. We're gonna go through a few options anyway and look into it. And uh, in addition to that, we're obviously gonna need a power supply and we're going to need a junction box. Well, you don't necessarily need it. It's always a good idea to obviously hide or your cables in a junction box and have cable restraints and everything else that happens to come with regulations. And now where does the 45 pounds come from? If you look at my screen, you can see everything that I actually have purchased for this exact project. I have the ESP. I purchased three of them for uh, 20 pounds, which is now coming to six pounds 67. To be fair, an ESP32 or a board that is compatible with the software that we're going to be installing can be much cheaper than that. Uh, if you go on Alibaba and you actually patient enough to wait for a couple of weeks, it's probably going to be within two pounds, three pounds, even less per PCB. But I just want to quick and easy. So I grab one of these, or I go grab three of these in this case, and uh, I'm just using one for this example. Then um, I'm using the address boiler strip from BTF, which is from what I've read on the internet, decent quality, uh, which is five meters, 60, LED uh, 60 pixels per meter. And it's IP, well, the one that I have is IP65, five meter length. It's the five volt variant, but there's also a 12 and 24 volt variant. So uh, you can mix and match depending on the power supply. Now. I did not necessarily purchase a 30 watt power supply because I probably have like a billion of them just laying around the house, including USB type C cables. However, just to be fair to the whole comparison, I I've added a 30 watt PSU and why did I add a 30 watt PSU? Now in my case, I only need about uh, one and a half meter worth of LED strip. It's 60 uh, pixels or 60 LEDs per meter. Uh, so let's say I have 90, for a million and a half, and every single one of them is 0 0.3 uh, watts. So you can see it's 27 watts for that whole LED strip at maximum brightness, and I'm probably never gonna be using it at maximum brightness anyway. However, uh, I did put a 30 watt PSU in the back of it, and of course a small junction box that you need in the back. Now, when it comes to actually setting it up, my soldering is absolutely horrible. I assume probably every single one of you has some kind of a soldering iron anyway, and you are somewhat familiar with soldering. Now this was probably one of my first, I don't know, few attempts at soldering, uh, and I managed to do it. But if you want to get the job done right, you can always find the pinout of your specific board because it does not need to be an ESP32. Um, it can be anything else compatible with WLED, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. And you can just go search Google and you're probably gonna find the correct pinouts to where you need to connect things to. So in my case, it is wired to uh, 
positive and negative, obviously. So a plus and minus on five volts because a five volt strip. And then you have the communication cable with a small resistor in between. That's pretty much all you need. Uh, and there's plenty of videos I'm going to show you how to do it properly with some soldering advice. But uh, once you get that done, it's going to look something like this. You can see mine in the junction box in here, uh, where we do have the power and communication connected. It's important to have the correct communication pin, obviously, and the connect, uh, correct power and ground pins. But again, you can find the pin out and everything else online. And I can link a few videos down below to show you the right devices. All of this is also going to be linked down in the description. So if you want to go and check out the devices, just click on them, go to the website and you can get going. The next thing that you're going to need is going to be flashing the firmware onto the device. Uh, the firmware is actually going to be what is going to be allowing us to control it and control the LEDs and also send commands from Logson to the ASP directly. Now, what we're going to do is you need the cable that's obviously plugged into your PC. It needs to be also plugged into a port that uh, has data uh, active, not only power. So pretty much every single port on your PC should be fine. Um, I'm going to plug the ESP in. And as soon as you plug it in, my PC should recognize it. Whoa. And the little light on it should probably flash on. For some ESP models, I know that whenever you plug it in and if you want to flash anything, you need to press and hold one of the buttons. So please do check which exact ESP you have in your case. If you want to go to a website, please use Chrome uh, as a browser. I know there's other browsers that are compatible, but it's not all of them. So Chrome is one of the examples that I know about. If you go to install.wled.me, you're going to be greeted by this, which is the WLED installer. Um, which is quite easy. It basically helps you format and flash the software onto your ESP directly. And you also have your step-by-step -step in here. Plug your ESP into the port, yada, yada, yada. Select whichever version you want, whether you want the release or the beta. I'm going to use the beta so I can report any issues uh, back to the developers. You can see that also other chipsets like ESP A266 are supported. And if you go down the rabbit hole, you'll actually be able to figure out that there's quite a few more that are supported, not just the ESP32s. Now, also quite frequently, whenever you select your version, select the option or select what kind of uh, WLED you want to flash on it and click install. This is going to be empty because most likely you don't have the drivers for the CP2102 or uh, the other chips that are available. So quite frequently, you're going to have the kit install, select COM port, and so on. If you don't find the device, you need to download and install that uh, software or that firmware for your PC, that driver. If you look at the ESP, I'm just going to change the screen. You see that I have the square one. So I have the CP2102 chip. I already have it installed. So once you have it installed, all you need to do is select which version you want. I want the latest beta again, as we said. You can grab the plain version or that's probably for a different video, but if you get a little microphone and connect to your ESP, you can also make it audio reactive. I'm just going to put the plain version on it and click install. Select my ESP that's currently connected. Press connect and click on install the BLED. Do you want to install? Yes. Install. And what it's going to do is now it's going to format it automatically. And in the next two minutes, it's going to install it through. I'm not going to make you sit through it. Let's go and skip this. And in two minutes time, you can see that installation is complete. So I can go to next. And the first thing that is going to come up with is going to be configuring the Wi-Fi settings. Now, basically what we need to do is I need to connect my ESP32 to the Wi-Fi because it does have Wi-Fi embedded on board. And this is how it's obviously going to be communicating on the local network. This is how you can connect your phone to it. And obviously we're going to be connecting locks onto it as well. So go and find your uh, Wi-Fi network. Click on connect. It's going to try and connect. Obviously, if your credentials are all correct, it should go through. Perfect. Device connected to the local network. And now what we can do is we can go and visit the device itself. So visit device, and you can see, first of all, there it is. It's sitting on this address. 
And if I had LED strips already connected to it, obviously I'm pre-flushing it. So it's gonna be pretty much ready to go uh, as soon as I connect my LED strips. I can come in here and already start playing with the colors, start playing with the modes and different effects and segments and so on that I have. What we want to do, uh, first of all, is you want to go to config uh, and you want to go to Wi-Fi setup. This is obviously your network, but you can also see this which is basically about which address, which host name, uh, or which MDNS the device is sitting on. And you can also see the client's IP that is currently sitting on. Now, I always tend to tell people to note it down, and I'm actually going to note it down in here in config. Um, so we have it and we can play with it. Now the address is this dot local. And obviously there's some HTTP in front of it. So if we click it, does it take us to the same place? Yes, absolutely it does. And this is the client's IP, which of course we can change. My number one recommendation is pretty much always the same. Go to your router and assign it a DCP reservation because that way there's gonna be no IP conflicts, nothing else is gonna take its place. You say okay, and that is pretty much our device configured. Now comes the interesting part. How do we get WLED to communicate with Loxon? Or how do we get Loxon to communicate with WLED and be able to set it up as you normally would? If we go online and just search um, WLED API, you'll be able to see that there is, well, the first thing that comes up is the knowledge base. Uh, for that API and the API is actually very easy to use. You can either use the host name or you can use the um, IP of the device on the local network with no credentials required. And you can send the command looking like this. So in here you have the LED controls. So for example, I can do on, off or toggle directly onto the device. I can do master color, I can do primary effect speeds and so on. All of this is available, however, the most amazing part is if you look all the way down, there's locks on commands. Someone has already compiled the string that is required for locks on commands because if you were to come in here and look at the lighting controller, obviously you know that the lighting controller sends uh, smart actuators, RGB values, and so on. And for example, that RGBW value uh, has a, a specific sequence of expression. So basically you can see it in here, blue, green, red, or brightness, uh, and so on and so on. And that is already compiled on the ESP or more specifically on the WLED software. So you don't have to do it, which means everything's gonna be a lot easier in our case. And if you want to just use it as a very basic RGBW uh, or just RGB LED strip, straight away we can use this command. So let's go and give it a go. So in here, Obviously, we're gonna be sending commands to it. Now you can send both UDP or HTTP commands. In this example, I'll do HTTP because, um, well, no, no particular reason. UDP is usually a fire and forget protocol, uh, but it's quite fast. I'm just going to use HTTP to show you uh, for this example. So we want a virtual output. That virtual output is going to be uh, going to HTTP and the IP address, which we noted earlier of the ESP 0229 uh, or alternatively you can also go to the uh, address above it's exactly the same basically press enter let's actually give it a name this is going to be our addressable LED strip perfect then in here we want to add virtual outputs and now the very first command that I'm going to add is going to be the primary colors. And a primary colors basically means if you were to have two or three or however many colors uh, in a sequence, the primary color is going to be the main one that is changing obviously between these sequences. And also if you don't have any effects, so it's not chasing, it's not pulsing, it's not doing anything, it's just a solid color, the primary color is, is going to be the one that is actually showing and is sitting on all the time. So. We come in here into the command. We already have uh, the IP address in here. So under the command, this is going to be, I'm just gonna call it uh, RGB 
color. And the command is going to be this, but it needs to have something in front of it. There we go. So it's win and whatever it is. So we can grab that part of it. There we go. We can say win and locks on. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to be forwarding the value directly from the lighting controller. So that's why I put the uh, slash V in there. And obviously the value that we're sending to the device is not going to be digital. It's going to be analog value that we're sending. So you want to untick this and just leave it as a value like this. Unit, it's just V. There's no decimal places required in there. So that should be pretty much it. So now we grab the RGBW value. We connect it to circuit one. And now what you want to do with your circuit is you come to the lighting circuit. You can call this addressable LED or under counter LED or whatever it is in the project. But more specifically, the type needs to be RGB. And we say, okay, save this in. And we can actually already test whether or not it works, even though you can see here's the value and how it's being compiled. Uh, you can see whether or not it works, even though our ESP is not physically connected to an LED strip, because obviously the commands are being sent to this controller. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the Loxon app or that mini server, go to the LED spaces, go to LED, click on more, click on the uh, light itself, and now I'll, I'll go and try and adjust the colors and see whether or not, yeah, we do reflect in here. Let's go to green, let's go into green, let's go into blue, let's go into blue. Let's go to, I'll say yellow, and let's actually try and reduce the brightness. I wanna see it down to about, yeah, 50%. And you can see brightness is reduced, temperature is reduced, everything is reacting on the WLED in real time. And I'll play some B-roll in here so you can see what's actually happening in the installation in real time. But that is pretty awesome because we already have full control and we can still use the same color wheel that we're using in Loxon. If I was to go and press off, you can see brightness goes all the way down. So the LED is essentially off in that case. Now, that is nice to have. But we're here for the addressable aspect. We're here, here for the cool stuff, for the chasing lights and everything else that we can have in the background. So in that case, there's a few other things that we can look at in here, which are, there we go, effect speed, effect intensity, and effect index. So you can see there's different commands, effects, assets, and so on. I'm just going to copy all of this because I'm not going to remember it. And we can come in here in config. I'm going to pop another notes on the page. Here's our commands. And you can see between what value they're receiving. So I'm going to create another, well, three actuators in this case, or uh, virtual output commands. One, two, three. And now the first one is going to be effect. Uh, I'm just going to call it effect selection because it sounds better than index. And we're going to do something very similar to what we did earlier. So if you were to look at the previous one, the prefix is forward slash win and something. And this one is not going to be no different in this case. So it's going to be forward slash win. Um, and what was it? Fx equals, and I'm going to give it a value again obviously not a digital output. And again, I'm going to just put it as V in here. Works good enough. Let's proceed to the next one. Uh, this is going to be four slash win and what do we say? Um, SX equals again V. Don't use it as digital. It's an analog. Say V in here. No correction values for now, so that's fine. 
uh, this is going to be what is x this is your effect speed so the easiest way to explain it is if your lights are chasing how quickly are they going to be chasing how quickly is that effect speed going to be and the effect intensity is the last one effect intensity I'll go digital output off again and like it's exactly the same win and uh what is this going to be again we need on we need to see it win and i x equals v okay there's our three effects drop it in here and now for me personally there's multiple different ways of doing it however uh, you can create specific effects in here in the block call the id and set the id to the effect selection effect intensity and speed and whatnot uh, all of that you can play with as much as you want to i think the easiest thing to do is you just create three virtual inputs one for each effect uh, or each option of that effect. So I'm going to have effects selection. And this is going to be effect intensity. And this is going to be effect speed. Now for all three of them, I'm going to go to the lighting controller, click on the little gear knob, click on the linked function blocks, and now I'm going to link the virtual inputs only. So effects, intensity, selection, and there we go. And now I'm going to put them in order. Effect selection, that's correct. Oh, well, that's perfect, actually. Apply. Close this. Save in the mini server. And probably the only thing that we need to adjust is you can see the... Uh, effect index is between 0 to 101, effect speed is between 0 and 255 and so on. So what you want to do is, well, you can use 0 to 100 if you want to, and then you can map it out. Um, or you can use 0 to 255 as a maximum value. Default value doesn't matter. Uh, in here, that's all fine. That can be a slider, step size can be one. And I think the rest are gonna be pretty, pretty similar. So we go to next one, 255, value one slider. And we go to maximum value 255, value one slider. Perfect. And even though the effect index is actually saying zero to 101, I've already tested it and I know that there's effects that are higher than that. So that's why I'm just putting 255 on all of them. But of course you can adjust this to 101, 80 or however many effects you're actually interested in. So we save this in the mini server. I go in the app and now in here under my LEDs, I'll hide these away actually because we don't want them to be visible. So don't use in use interface. Or at least I don't want them to be visible there. Where I want them to be, vis be visible is whenever I go to my light, if I scroll down, here's my effect selections, intensities, and so on. So in here, I can literally just go one, two, three. And I can go through different effects. Uh, and then on the actual LED, uh, where did my Chrome go? There it is. It is going to be selecting the wipe effect, for example, in this case. If I go to the next one, it's wipe random. If I go to the next one, it's random colors and so on and so forth. As you can see, we can already have the adjustment of all of the effects. I can adjust the intensity, the speed and all of that. And you can see here's the effect speed. It's currently set to three. But if I go back to my Loxon app, uh, effect speed, let's set it to perhaps 160. And you can see it's set to 160. So it responds pretty much immediately on every single command that I give it, which is 
perfect in our case. Now, that is pretty much everything you need, uh, really. The only thing that I tend to uh, do in this case as well is I come in here, I go and set either the mood or the double click to send the command. And you can probably guess what command I'm going to be sending. Uh, it's the off command because every now and again, you might be adjusting the effects manually in here and you leave the room and you double click and something happens, but the effects is still staying on. So what we can do is we can create another digital command, which we can just say is called off. I can't remember which exactly that is. Uh, there we go, off on toggle. So it's just NT and it's zero. So that is the one NT. So we do four slash win NT equals to zero. We can use it as digital in this case have it as an off on the double click. There we go. So whenever you leave the room, save this into the mini server. And now if they go in the app, regardless of what setting I have, if I go and click off, or if I go and double click in here or double click on the switch on my way out of the room, you'll be able to see that that translates pretty much immediately to everything being off in here, which is perfect. Awesome. Uh, that's about it. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.